Man, it's good to see people in church today. This is encouraging for me. I love it. Yeah, yes. Amen. Amen. Once again, online, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're so grateful for you as well. I wanted to give you guys a couple quick things that are coming up. We are developing a plan to return to Kids Church. Woo! So our goal is on September 13th to actually open our kids' ministry back up. Uh, for kids. And, and of course, we'll, we're going to follow the guidelines. We're going to do the measures and, and all of that stuff. But, but we're excited to do this. We're excited to offer kids. Any kids in the house today? Can our kids make some noise? Can y'all clap? Are you guys excited to get back to it too? So, so we're, 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 we're eager. Um, right now, we have, so we have four Sunday, Sunday morning coordinators who are right now in the process of reaching out uh, to people who have served on the kids' ministry team before. This is a great time, time for you. If you've never served before and you're interested in plugging in somewhere to kind of get involved, our hope and our plan is that with, with the proper participation, that we will only be asking people to serve uh, one time a month. And so that's an awesome opportunity for you to, uh, to you know, instill, instill the Word of God into young people's lives and, you know, to kind of do that legacy thing that we just prayed about. So if, that's, if that kind of resonates with you a little bit, stirs your heart a little bit, we'd love for you to, be, uh, to jump on that team as well. But, but for those of you who were on the kids' team, if you're getting phone calls and text messages uh, from these coordinators, if you could do me a huge favor and, and let them know what your plan is, what your intention is. If you're not quite ready to jump back in, we understand that. It would just be good for us from a planning perspective to understand kind of where you are uh, in, in this thing. Does that sound good? You guys can do that for me. And then tonight, students, we're going to get together at 5.30. All right, so the students are always like the quietest. They're like a little awkward, like, oh, I don't really know if we want to make noise. Thank you. Okay, praise the Lord. That's good. Good. So we're going to watch uh, the brand new movie called Finding Nemo. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's been out for a little while. But it's clean, okay, right? There's no cursing in it, parents. So we had an RSVP for this, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but if you didn't RSVP, student, and you still want to come tonight, just crash our party, okay? Come on in. We'll, have, we'll, have, we'll figure out the food part. We'll order some extra pizzas, and we'll make sure that you guys are covered too. I said pizza, all right, students? So come on. All right, so we are in a series in, uh, out of the book of Isaiah. And you know, Isaiah isn't like the most... Uh, you know, Philippians was like super like rejoiceful and joy-filled. Isaiah is kind of like quite the opposite. It's kind of like the polar opposite of what Philippians was. Isaiah um, is really, uh, he's a prophet and he's bringing a warning to the people of Judah because they have, they've fallen away from God and, and they're not pursuing him the way that, that they should be. You know, he was, he was the one who rescued them out of the desert, rescued them out of, out of slavery, and now they're not following him. And, and, and you kind of see this happen over and over um, in, in the history of Israel. And Isaiah is a prophet called by God to speak on behalf of God before the people. And he is warning them, like saying, hey, like get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Return to your first love. All these sins, all these things that you were doing before, you've got to stop doing them. Because if you don't, judgment is coming. And I think for me, like Isaiah, I mentioned this maybe in the very first week of the series. Isaiah is one of those books for me that was pivotal for me in my young adult years. I'm talking college years. When you're getting all kinds of things from college professors and they're really... Just instilling things in your mind that can cause you to question who God is, whether he's real. You know, you kind of learn, you hear different things like in your biology class about, about the origin of life and that kind of stuff. And it really, for me, man, it just kind of got me, got me wondering, like, have I, been, have I been living this lie? Have I been believing something that's not true? The book of Isaiah was pivotal for me in understanding prophetically how a prophet 700 years before Jesus came to the earth spoke specifically about Jesus. Not only about him, not only the God's plan for redemption through Christ, but even the death of Jesus and his resurrection. And then the prophet Isaiah also talks about eternity. And we see some of the same correlation from the New Testament. So for me, like, it gets me really excited to, to, to be in this study. And so I hope you guys are getting something out of it. And I hope it's encouraging you. Today we're going to be in chapters 24 through 27. We're kind of taking it at a high level. Uh, I think this is our third week, third or fourth week, third week I think of, um, of Isaiah. And so today we're going to specifically look at God's judgment. We're going to look at the purpose in God's judgment. And so I know when we think about that and when we hear that, sometimes we wonder, well, is God like, is he mean? Like, is he just kind of up there like waiting for me to mess up so he can hit me with the lightning bolt, you know? Like, does he have, like, some monster golf club in the sky, and he's just ready to whack me into the ocean if I, if I mess up? Like, is that, is that God? Is that the purpose in God's judgment? Is he just, he just wants to punish people that, that don't listen to him? Is that his heart? And so we're going we're gonna to look at that a little bit today. And, of course, I'll go ahead and answer that question right up front. And the answer is no. 
The heart of the Father is to pursue lost sheep. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ. But we'll get, we'll get more to that. And I know sometimes, you know, again, this series is so different. You, you guys might be thinking, Pastor, you're talking a lot about sin. You're talking a lot about judgment. Yes, I am, because it's important. Because sin ruins everything. Sin ruined God's original creation. God had, this wasn't, no, I'm not going to say that. You know, in the garden, we didn't even have clothes on. So maybe that's the one good thing. <laughs> But no, but seriously, like, like, like creation got ruined. God's perfect plan for creation was ruined by sin. So of course we need to talk about sin. And if sin separates us from God, and if eventually sin leads us into eternal death, then to not talk about sin does a disservice to Jesus and to what he died on the cross for. He died on the cross for our sin. We're going to talk about sin because the Bible talks about sin. And there's many forms of it. Sin comes in, and you can name more, but we've got hate. Pride, addiction, racism, greed, lust, murder. Sin has messed up the lives of many people, the marriages of many people, the careers of many people. It's messed up God's perfect creation. But God had a plan for restoration. And you see it right out of the gate. Genesis chapter 3, right after the original sin, right? Adam and Eve, they take part in that fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. And right away, verse 15 of chapter 3, God makes a declaration. He talks about how the enemy is going to strike the heel, but how he is going to crush the head of the serpent. And ultimately what that is, is it's already foreshadowing and it's already pointing toward God's redemptive plan of bringing Jesus into, onto this earth to forgive us of our sins. The enemy would, 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 would strike a blow against him in, in Christ's death on the cross, but ultimately he would strike his head through the resurrection power of God. And now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Ultimately God had a plan right out of the gate. But that doesn't mean there weren't consequences. There were consequences immediately. In fact, in that very next verse, he, uh, God, God tells Adam and Eve, he says, For dust you are, and to dust you will return. He's talking about death. But again, human sin brought this on. This wasn't God's plan. This isn't what God wanted to do. He didn't want to, he's, he's not a guy with a lightning bolt in the sky. He doesn't have a giant golf club. It, it was never what he wanted to do. But sin has consequences, and the, and the consequence of sin is death. And so since that moment, the earth has been spiraling toward this final judgment that we are not a part of yet, but in times of our lives, in the short term, we can see where God's corrective hand is upon our life, and he brings discipline into our lives to correct us, to bring us back into right standing and to, and to course correct. But as we spiral toward this, toward this final judgment that is to come one day, and whether in our lifetimes or the next, as the people of God, we have a role to play in slowing down the deterioration of our society. The more we give in, the more we ignore immorality, the more we mi misrepresent God, the more we contribute to the deterioration of our society. But the more we renounce sin, the more we speak against immorality, the more we share God's word, the more we slow down this deterioration. We are the salt of the earth. God has positioned us on this earth to make a difference. And so we can actually slow down what's happening. We can actually stand up for truth. We can stand up for justice. We can make a difference. And I know sometimes, you know, you talk about media, you talk about social media, it looks like, it looks like there's nothing that we can do. No, that, that's not real life. Real life is what happens between you and your neighbors. Real life is what happens at the table when you're talking with somebody about Jesus Christ. All right, real life doesn't happen in the comment sections of a social media post. Real life happens between face-to-face, -face, flesh and blood. That's why it's so important for us to kind of begin to get back together as we can and begin to encourage one another and begin to fellowship with one another and begin to hold one another accountable again, okay? So, but nevertheless, whether we slow it down or not, there is coming a day where the whole earth will be judged. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. Basically, he's saying everybody. Everybody will be subject to God's judgment. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken his word. And so this isn't like something that maybe will come, maybe won't come. No, this will be a day 
in the future. This hasn't happened yet, but there will be an ultimate judgment to come. Why has this happened? Verse 5, it happened because of sin. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, right? The things that God teaches, the laws of God. They violated the statutes, right? They, they've changed the laws. They've, they've changed the moral compass. Like they call good things bad and they call bad things good now. And they've broken down, broken the everlasting covenant. Like they've completely refused God and his ways. And so because God is holy, sin demands a response. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 6. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. And it goes on through verse 13, kind of describing what that looks like. And I mean, can you, I, mean I, can find, I can feel the heaviness even right now as I'm sharing this. Can you imagine Isaiah proclaiming this to those people? You want to understand why Isaiah got sawn in half? His people, they rejected him and they brutally killed him. He brought a heavy word, a heavy correction to the people and they completely rejected it. Today be warned by Isaiah. Be warned by the gospel. Be warned by the word. This is a warning for us of of big ideas of future judgment to come on the earth. And maybe you're wondering, like, Pastor, do you want us to feel good when we leave church? (laughs) I do. I do. But I don't want it to be because I lied to you or I misrepresented what the Bible says. I want it to be because you're in right standing with God. That's why why you're going to leave feeling good. Because you said yes to Jesus. Because he's the author of your faith and he's going to see it through to perfect completion. I want you to feel good when you leave church because you've been in the presence of the Lord, not because you've been misled. And so, you know, Isaiah is here. He's bringing this correction. And so so heed this. If this is something that you've been wrestling with, if you're wrestling with disobedience from God's word, then heed this warning from the Bible today. Your understanding of the gospel is incomplete without your understanding of God's judgment. Your understanding of the gospel is incomplete without your understanding of of God's judgment. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you can't fully understand the magnitude of good news unless you know how bad the bad news was. You've got to understand what God has saved you from. That's why the gospel is so sweet. That's why the gospel is so powerful. That's why it's so transformative, because he saved us from eternal death. That's what makes the good news so good. Without that, you don't even know what you've been saved from. God is more interested in our holiness than he is in our happiness. Some people think, man, well, I'm on this earth, and doesn't God want me happy? Doesn't God want me happy? <laughs> Maybe, but first he wants you holy, right? And when you're holy, when you're in right standing with God, when you have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus brings the joy into your heart, all right? And so more than, more than you being happy with the things of life, God wants you to be holy. He wants you to be set apart. Right? Jesus went through a lot of different struggles. Jesus went through trial. Jesus was put on a cross. Are we, his servants, any better than him? Is every moment of our life going to be happy? No, it's not. But through those moments that are even difficult, God, he's instilled a joy within us. He wants us holy. He wants us set apart. He wants us right. If things that make you happy are opposed to God's word, then he doesn't want you happy. (laughs) If that's your definition of happiness. Look, put Jesus first, and he'll direct your steps. You'll have the joy of the Lord. And then for those in right standing, look at how they're able to respond in the midst of very unsteady times. Verse 14, chapter 24. They raise their voices. These are the people in right standing with God. Look, hear their emotion, right? This is going to be us. You stay faithful. You stay faithful to Jesus. You had the shed blood of Jesus applied to your sin, to the sin of your life, right? You've been... This has been a heavy word, but listen, here's what's to come for those who stay faithful. They raise their voices, they shout for joy. From the west, they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the islands of the sea, from the ends of the earth, we hear singing glory to the righteous one. Glory to the righteous one. Who is the righteous one? The righteous one is the one who makes all things right. It's God. And some celebrate that God made all things right, as we see right here. But for so many, making all things right means something terrible for them. When God makes all things right, 
it won't be good for everybody. Because unless they've confessed Jesus as the Lord and the leader of their life, they'll die in their sin. And the Bible teaches us that they will go to hell. They'll be eternally separated from God. And that's not God's heart. That's not our heart as a church. Man, if you're in here and you're like, what is this dude hellfire and brimstone preaching today? Like, that's not our heart. That's not what we want. But this is what the Bible tells us. And if I lie, if I lie to you, then what good is that going to be? Isaiah sees this, and it wrecks him. Verse 16, but I said, I waste away, I waste away. Woe to me, the treacherous betray, with treachery, the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare await you, O people of the earth. Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a, in a snare. He's saying there's no escaping this final judgment of God. Look, the floodgates of heavens are opened. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls, never to rise again. Verse 21, in that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens. He's talking about the spiritual forces of evil that move about throughout the earth. And the kings on the earth below, they will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. Some think, what a mean God. Why would he do this? Believers think, oh, what a merciful God who made a way for me to escape the wrath of his judgment that I so deserved. Others wonder, why does he have to judge? Again, he has to judge because God is holy and sin demands a response from God. For the sinner, you need to fear God. Jesus was talking to his disciples in, in Luke chapter 12. He was talking about the Pharisees. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Like they're saying do one thing, but they're not doing it at all. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The sinner should be terrified. The believer the believer's fear is a little bit different. The believer's fear is one of awe. It's one of reverence. It's one of honor. It's one of respect. You're a believer today, which I, I've got to kind of assume that if you're in church that most, most people probably here are. Maybe if you're tuning in online, maybe, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. If you're a believer today, know that you're in right standing with God. You don't have to fear him in that way. Fear him because he has the power, Right? But you don't have to wonder, am I really saved? Listen, if you confess Jesus as the Lord and the, and the leader of your life and you've made him that, you've confessed your sin before God, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. But if you're, if you're, if you're lost in your sin today, you need to make it right. So which camp is Isaiah in? We'll find out right here. Isaiah praises God for God's holiness and God's righteousness. Isaiah says in, in chapter 25, verse 1, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. So Isaiah, he's seeing a glimpse of the future. He's remembering, look, that sin, sin separated and sin messed up. But God, things that you planned long ago, I'm beginning to see what your final plan is and how restoration is coming. 
On this mountain, verse 6, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Again, the Lord has spoken. He's going to wipe away every tear. There's going to come a day where we're going to go before the Lord. And we're going to stand before him. And the only thing that we might have regrets about at that moment is that we didn't do more when we were on this earth. God's going to wipe every tear from our eye. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more loss. There'll be full understanding and fully understanding who God is and what he's done. And the righteousness of God that was applied to our lives on this earth, it'll all make sense. It'll all come together in that moment. And that ought to bring some joy to your heart. Look, and I love the correlation. Now, I love how Isaiah can, um, can, can, can really touch the, the New Testament as well. So, so, you know, we talked about how Old Testament, New Testament, how it all kind of comes together, talks about Jesus, talks about eternity. Look, Revelation chapter 7, verse 17, John the Revelator gets a glimpse of heaven as well. He's there, and he, see, and he sees heaven, and he says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He's not just repeating something because he knows that Isaiah wrote it. No, God is giving him a glimpse of what heaven's going to look like. You see the connection. Let this build your faith today. You thought the Bible was some old, archaic piece of work, piece of literature? No. The Bible is a living, breathing document handed down from generation to generation, protected by God for your good, to bring you into right standing, to show the word of the Lord to you. And so what you need to do is know it and be in it and memorize it and pray it. Pray it for your life. Stand on the promises of God that are before you in the word of God and declare it over your life. And when the enemy tries to come in like a flood and distract you and push you and cause you to doubt and cause faith to to drain out of your body, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. You got to open up the Bible every once in a while and say, I don't care what society says about it. What does God say about it? Because I'm going to stand on this thing because I believe this thing. This is the word of God for the people of God. This is the truth of God. This is who you want. You want to get to know God better? Get to know him through his word. He's revealed himself. He hasn't hidden himself from you. He's not a secret. Okay, he's revealed through this book right here. And you have a copy as well, and you've got it on your phone, and you've got it all around your house. So start using it. Start proclaiming it. Verse 9, in that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Are you trusting God? Are you trusting God? I want you to look at the promise in the next chapter for those of you who are trusting God. Verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 3. And you know this because you've been trusting God. But here's what he says. God, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. You will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is steadfast. Again, I already said it, but when you start to waver, man, remember who you are. Remember that you're a child of God, the King of Kings. He's going to hold your mind steadfast. You won't be moved by circumstances. You'll be able to trust God for all the work in your life, all the good things. He continues, verse 9, so because of that, because of God's faithfulness, My soul yearns for you in the night. Come on, you ever been laying in your bed at night just thinking about God, just wondering about him, his vastness, his glory, his goodness to you? My soul yearns for you in the night, in those quiet moments. Come on, tonight when you lay your head down on that pillow, wonder about him, think about him, pray to him, seek his heart, seek his face, thank him for the blessings of God upon your life. My soul yearns for him. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. Come on, in the shower. You can't hold a tune. That's all right. (laughs) Sing. Sing for his goodness. Sing for his glory. Sing because he's been so good. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world, they'll learn righteousness. Come on, 
He's going to make all things right. Maybe they didn't live it out in that time, but they'll learn it when he makes all things right. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Another prophetic moment. Man, I love this. Come on, let this encourage you. That moment when Jesus comes, when he reveals himself in the sky, Isaiah sees it too. Your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 12. In that day the Lord will thresh, he'll judge. From the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt. And you, O Israelites, will be gathered up one by one. And in that day a great trumpet will sound. Those who are perishing in Assyria and those who are exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. God's purpose, the question that we asked at the beginning, what's God's purpose in judgment? Is it just because he's mean? No. God's purpose in judgment is not vengeance. Although vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, the Bible tells us. But it's not his purpose in judgment. That's not the reason behind his judgment. Listen, God's purpose in judgment is to restore all things. To restore all things. To make all things right again. And not for you. (laughs) And not for me. He does it for his glory. He does it for his glory. So that whether you followed him on this earth or whether you rejected him on this earth, one day you will know that he is glorified. One day every knee will confess, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord and he will get his glory. He does it for his glory. And he makes all things new. He makes all things new. The way that he originally designed, he makes it new again. Even you. You sick of this old body? (laughs) Gotten a little chunkier around the midsection like me? Maybe we'll get a reshot, a retry at it. He'll make all things new. Even you. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Look, he wants to restore you, not for you, for his glory. He created you for perfect communion with him. Sin separated that. But through this restorative act, through this final judgment, he will restore all things. Come on, let's tie it to the New Testament again. Isaiah, Isaiah, 700 years ago, look, what does the New Testament say? What does Paul see? We just saw Isaiah talk about how God's going to raise people up out of the grave. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. Where are we at? Here we are. Y'all still with me? Here we go. Paul's writing. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. For whose glory? God's glory. Amen. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Satan, you thought that you struck the heel of Jesus. You thought you put Jesus in the grave. No, no, no. He crushed your head back in Genesis. It was done. As God declared it in Genesis chapter 3, so it was, so it happened, and so it will be. Satan will be eliminated forever, forever. Death and destruction will be gone. Sin and separation will be removed from God as the wrath of God falls upon this, as judgment comes upon the earth. But you will be saved. God will save you. That was his plan from the beginning. 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Check this out. Chapter, uh, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Look, you think, you think what in the world is happening around me? Come on. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. God's given you purposes and giftings to use for his glory. Not for us to take any kind of credit for it. Somebody gives you a gift, you don't take the credit for it. Like, they gave it to you. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. God's given you gifts and purposes. Thank him for them and use them for his glory. So he's going to restore everything. And we'll have communion with him just like intended before sin. And so some I know might be wondering, in a cynical way maybe even, what's he waiting for? <laughs> Hasn't it gotten bad enough? Like, man, come on. Like, this, like the earth is, is, is reeling. Like, like, what is in the world is happening? Aren't things bad enough? Like, what's he waiting for? Is he real? Is he really going to come? Is there ever going to be a day where we're really going to see Jesus? 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. You want to know why, what he's waiting for? He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Don't mock God. Don't mock him. If you're separated from Jesus, or you're not really following the Lord, but somehow you're tuning in today, or you're here in the room with us today, don't mock him. He's slow and he's patient because he loves you and because he's merciful. It's his, whole, it's his whole hope that you'll come to repentance. You guys stand with me? Look, if you've walked away from God, there's a road to redemption. And it's through Jesus. This morning, obviously, I don't know where every single person in the room or online is. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know if you've ever made Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life. But I'm telling you, man, there's no greater purpose to live for. Today, I hope and I pray and I pray that the word has penetrated your heart. I pray that it's prepared you to say yes to Jesus if you haven't already. And look, it's a, it's a real simple thing to confess and believe. But it's going to cost you everything. The very lordship of your life, you give it up in pursuit of him who died for you. But come on, if you're ready to do that, with every head bowed, with every eye closed this morning, you can, pray, you can pray a prayer of confession. You can say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. And I recognize my sin, and I recognize how my sin has separated me from you but I want forgiveness. I want to be empowered by the Spirit of God to turn from sin in pursuit of Jesus. I repent of my sin. That just means you, you turn from doing it, you believe it's wrong, you understand it's wrong, and you've, you, you push it, it, it's behind you now. You repent of it, you turn. And I pursue you. You're the author of my faith. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you for anyone who prayed that prayer this morning with me. But Lord, I know it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. It's not some kind of thing where we want fire insurance and we just want to not have to go through the wrath of your judgment. But God, we want truly, God, I pray that, that our heart's desire would be out of love for you, out of adoration for you. Lord, I pray that your word has challenged us today, all of us, to live a life of holiness, to live a life that declares to the watching world that we are set apart. And we're not hateful. Lord, it's not your will that anyone would perish, but that all, that, but that, but that all would come to the, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins. And Lord, as your spirit is within us, that's our heart too. And so help us to go throughout this life in a way that, yes, holds the truth for what it is, 
isn't afraid to declare the truth, but God, God that, that, but, but that can speak it in love. God, we, your word says that it's your kindness that leads to repentance. God, let us be kind. Let us be loving. Let us represent you well. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to worship together with one more song. Can you guys do that with me? Come on. The God of heaven is attentive to the prayers of his people. The God of heaven is the one that you came here for today, not to see me preach, not to see this band worship, although we're grateful for them. Aren't they awesome? You came here to meet with God. So let's meet with God together. Come on, let's go after him. Do something you've never done before, maybe. You know what I'm trying? I, I really want there to be a spirit of freedom in this church. I really want us to get freed up in our worship. And look, I know that some, that, that I'm not fussing at you. You know that. <laughs> I, just want, I just want you to be free. You know, you, this, is a, this is a safe place. If you want to lift your hands and worship, you know what this does? You know what this says? It says, God, I surrender to you. That's all you're saying. You're not saying, hey, look at me, everybody. I'm spiritual. No, no, no. You're saying, Father, I surrender to you. All right? Whether it looks like this or this or this, I don't care. But come on, express yourself. Express yourself out of joy and out of love and out of honor for the one who paid it all for you. Amen? Amen. Let's go after God. Come on.